Hello everyone! Good morning, good afternoon or good evening wherever you might be watching the second edition of the International Aesthetic Masters. This is the fifth day of this great Congress and we have been having some impressive feedbacks. Thank you to all of the participants that resonate with us with this mission of bringing knowledge on a global scale. Today we start by Italy and we meet my friend Alessandro Pozzi. Dr. Pozzi was formally trained in the interrelated areas of oral surgery, prosthodontics and laboratory technology. He got his PhD in orthodontics and TMJ dysfunctions and now is currently an adjunct associate professor at the Goldstein Center for Aesthetic and Implant Dentistry of Augusta University Dental College of Georgia, USA. Alessandro is also a clinical lecturer in the section of Restorative Dentistry School of Dentistry at UCLA University in Los Angeles. As a researcher and scientist, he carries on clinical researches on the cutting edges technologies in order to simplify the surgical and prosthetic procedures, performing the patient rehabilitation with maximum accuracy, minimal invasiveness and natural aesthetics. He has been selected to receive the 2013 Judson C. Hickey Scientific Writing Award in the Clinical Report category. Dr. Pozzi is a former researcher and professor of oral rehabilitation at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, Italy, and a former interim chair of oral surgery implantology at the University in Ancona, Italy. He is also active member of the Academy of Osseo Integration of the Italian Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry and of the Digital Dentistry Society. Dr. Alessandro Pozzi will present his approach to the subject Guided Surgery and Aesthetics. Digital Workflow for Predictable Immediate Function and Osseo Integration. It is a pleasure to have him and have the chance to watch his lecture. See you soon. Welcome to everyone. This is Alessandro Pozzi from Rome, Italy, and it's a great pleasure and honor to meet all of you on this terrific web platform dedicated to the global education. First of all, let me thank our friend of the International Aesthetic Master 2017 that developed this unique opportunity for sharing knowledge and learning on a global base. As I told you, I'm based in Rome, and this is my clinical facility and international training center where we are welcoming colleagues from all over the world. Colleagues that want to have an insight on what it's possible, on how it's possible to apply in a predictable way the modern digital approach uh, to implant dentistry in their daily routine. Because uh, 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 when we come up to digital dentistry and particularly guided surgery, we need to think to a more comprehensive concept that include not only the surgical aspect, but most of all the prosthetic aspect. And that's why we are talking more and more not only about a guided surgery, but most of all about a guided surgery and guided prosthetics to highlight what uh, uh, currently means guided surgery. Currently means working with the end in mind, working, thinking about what we need and the patient want 
to deliver in his mouth at the end of the implant treatment. And I was so proud a couple of years ago uh, to lecture in the open symposium of the Academy of, this, of OS Integration on this topic, just to tell you how much is the interest of the global dental community on the risk and rewards related to the use in a daily routine of the modern digital approach to implant dentistry. In fact, uh, digital is a wonderful baby, but it's still a baby that needs evidence experience and common sense. However, it's about 15 years that we have been researching, that we have been working with the digital protocol. And it's time to draw a line and to provide the guidelines. And that's why we uh, have uh, widely published uh, our digital protocols in uh, some of the most well-known peer review journal in order to try to validate uh, our experience. And uh, we, we, when we come up uh, to the different type of protocol, we publish uh, a wide range of follow-up from three to ten years of follow-up and we try to challenge the digital implant dentistry for the treatment of the conventional and the easy heal site but also we try to challenge the digital implant dentistry for the treatment of the most aggressive clinical protocol and scenario as for example the placement of the implant in a fresh alveolar socket or the immediate function and the immediate implant placement and function and uh, if we consider all the results that we publish, the overall uh, percentage of clinical success, it's pretty high. So I really feel confident that when we follow the guidelines, digital implant dentistry can be a game changer. And, and uh, that's why today, 100% of the implants in my clinical practice are positioned with the digital approach, and particularly 70% with the guided template-assisted surgery, and 30% with the navigation implant surgery. One of the most fascinating use of guided surgery is the treatment of the aesthetic zone. Since the beginning, uh, when we start with the use of guided surgery, uh, we uh, immediately got that the guided surgery could be of great help for the treatment of the anterior zone. However, at that time, however, at that time uh, of uh, partial or single case was uh, completely of lab. Do not forget that the guided surgery was born for the treatment of the dentalus patient. And uh, the double scan protocol, the double scan radiographic protocol, at that time was the only protocol to import into the Noble Guide software the information related to the patient anatomy and the prosthetic outcome that uh, could drive the implant positioning. And that's why we develop uh, a sort of functional and radiographic mock-up that uh, could be tried into the patient's mouth before the CBCT scanning and that could bring all the information related to the prosthetic contour, related to the aesthetic and functional shape of the tooth that we have to deliver into the patient's mouth on the top of our implant. At this time point, the patient was scanned with this functional and aesthetic radiographic template, and later on, the template was scanned alone, and uh, what we achieve is a two set of DACON data that could be imported into the 3D implant planning software to merge together the bone anatomy with the 
prosthetic contour of the teeth that we want to deliver, and in this case of these two lateral incisors that we want to deliver. At this time point, we have quite all the information that we need to plan the implant in a comprehensive way, positioning the implant according with the bone anatomy, according with the position of the adjacent teeth, and most of all, according with the prosthetic contour that we have to be able to deliver at the end of the implant treatment. And so we started to treat the first case that was a simple case, but not so simple, because when we come up to the anterior zone, the major difficulties are related to this uh, very uh, uh, tight surgical space that uh, we need to address in a minimal invasive way if we want to get all the benefit of the guided surgery. So what we did at that time, we first of all start with a conventional incision on the right side, while on the uh, uh, on the side of the left lateral incisor, we just pull the tooth out and we use the current alveolar fresh extraction socket to position the implant. It's funny to look at this 11 years old movie because at that time we were so worried about the positioning of the surgical template that we were used to fix the template with two anchor pin on the palatal vault in order to get it very stable, in order to secure the template onto the right position on the tooth on the dental surface. Another interesting part that uh, for sure when we work with digital we don't want to change our current protocol. So what we did at that time is looking into the market for osteotome that could be longer and could be address the longer distance between the top of the sleeve and the final position of the implant platform. And so what we did, we positioned the implant with the right, on the right side with the minimal invasive flap procedure and with the left side with the flapless, completely flapless procedure. And what we achieve uh, is a tremendous speed up of the healing of the soft tissue architecture. Because what we immediately understood is that if you save the anatomy of the soft tissue, the overall healing and maturation of the soft tissue will be faster and faster. Another great point that we immediately uh, figure out was that when we place the implant with the flapless guided approach or with the mini flap guided approach, we can use a longer implant. And using longer implant is the best guarantee when we treat patient with a very young age. And considering the, that even when we treat patients uh, that are not young at all, uh, however, the life expectancy is getting longer and longer. That's why one of the major advantages of working with a guided or, guided or digital assisted implant surgery is that we can place a longer implant, longer implant that can look for high quality bone structure and can guarantee the success over time. The life of our patient is becoming longer and longer. This time point, uh, we need to uh, spend a few words uh, on the type of material, of the type of restorative option that we can deliver on the top of our implant. It was uh, 2006 at that time, and uh, what we start to develop is a new CAD CAM protocol that could uh, uh, be, be used uh, to get the advantage of guided surgery in terms of a biology. 
because one of the major advantage of using the CAD CAM material to enhance the healing and the maturation over time of the soft tissue interface. And that's why we use the CAD CAM to uh, design and deliver later on uh, a nice, properly contoured uh, prosthetic and restorative interface. And it's very funny when I look at this picture, because at that time, the only material available was the white zirconia and the alumina material. For the youngest generation, maybe you don't remember the alumina dioxide. Alumina dioxide was a very interesting material uh, particularly in the static zone, because at that time we only had uh, white zirconia. White milky zirconia, uh, from the static standpoint, it's so difficult to hide as uh, the gray uh, metal cast superstructure or uh, as the gray titanium cut can material. That's why what we did, we designed and fabricate a white zirconia abutment and on the top of this abutment we uh, fabricate an alumina copying properly designed in order to support uh, to porcelain thespatic veneer. So at the end of the treatment journey, the patient was rehabilitated with the multiple ceramics restoration onto the implant uh, with the screw retain option that even at that time was considered, and even today even more, as the best option to rehabilitate and restore our implants. So we are looking for more and more screw retain option because it's the most flexible option that can guarantee the retrievability over time. On the central incisor, we deliver two uh, phosphatic porcelain veneer and this is the final outcome of the full restoration onto the master cast. And this is the final outcome of the patient's smile with a tremendous uh, uh, improvement in terms of aesthetics. But this is not the point because of working with guided surgery in the anterior zone, it's not only a matter of aesthetics, it's most of all a matter of increasing the predictability of the aesthetic treatment, of the implant treatment in the anterior zone, uh, uh, achieving at the same time a, a, an amazing clinical outcome in terms of uh, uh, bone resorption pattern over time and in terms of uh, clinical outcome over time and in terms of biological outcome of our soft tissue interface over time. And you can see how uh, the, we start following up the patient. You can see the maturation of the soft tissue around this full ceramic implant restoration uh, completely screw retain. A close-up view of the pristine situation of the patient. You see how the anatomy, the soft tissue of the anatomy uh, of the patient at the recipient site was completely flap, flat. We didn't have any type of papilla and the big challenge in the anterior zone is uh, reshaping a flat soft tissue anatomy and bone anatomy to deliver a scallop anatomy that can embrace our implant supported restoration. Uh, the, uh, dynamic, uh, the, uh, the dynamic of the light uh, uh, of the four restoration was pretty similar, so we achieve a nice aesthetic integration. But uh, what we focus on over time was the integration of the restoration uh, into the soft tissue. And it's funny how the behavior of the implant on the right side was completely different compared to the behavior of the implant on the left side. What do we achieve, and this is the last follow-up, it's a 11-year follow-up, uh, was uh, uh, a, a, an incredible 
uh, overgrow of the soft tissue on the right implant side. This is because on the right implant side we uh, uh, perform a, a mini flap guided so, uh, guided implant positioning. And at the uh, at the end of the implant positioning, we perform the a uh, modified roll flap procedure. So at the right uh, uh, implant side, on one side we open uh, um, a, a small flap with the spare papilla incision flow, uh, of approach and at the same time we increase the amount of soft tissue uh, 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 rolling the flap on the buccal side. On the left side we perform a pure flapless approach and you see that in both sides the architecture of the soft tissue is absolutely maintained at the 11 year follow up but you can see the difference in terms of amount of soft tissue. We need to graft soft tissue all the time in all the clinical scenario when we treat the anterior zone. Or maybe we need to develop a better understanding of the behavior of the soft tissue, particularly when we work with a minimal invasive approach, when we work with the guided minimal invasive approach. If we look at the percentage of success reported in the literature, the flapless guided approach uh, has a percentage of success that are absolutely comparable to the conventional open flap approach. And if we look at the, uh, uh, the um, behavior of the soft tissue in well-conducted clinical manuscript in which the authors investigate with the 3D planning the implant site before delivering a flapless, a flapless approach. So we can see that the percentage of a massive buccal reception, uh, so a buccal reception higher than one millimeter, uh, this massive buccal recession occurred only in 11% of the case. So in most of the case, the mean gingival recession was about 0.27 millimeter with a standard deviation of 0.38. And the mean papillary height loss was about 0.23 millimeter with a standard deviation of 0.27 millimeter. So, do we need to be really worried about such a little amount of soft tissue loss? Moreover, when we deliver on the top of the implant a biologic friendly restoration, what we need, what we can expect from the soft tissue is a trend to rebound over time. So the soft tissue, as in the clinical case that you look previously, uh, in my lecture, can grow over a CAD-CAM biological compatible restoration. Uh, when we come up to the bone, in the last 15 years, we try to investigate also the behavior of the bone with the CBCT examination performed over time. And it's very nice, uh, this is one of the oldest CBCT assessment in which you can visualize the pristine recipient site of the patient is the previous case with the two lateral incisor. You can see the original implant scenario. You can see the uh, 3D implant positioning into the software. And you can see what we deliver. And you can see the interplay between the implant positioning and the buccal bone anatomy. And the, at the day 10 years of follow-up, the buccal plate is still there. And the buccal plate is still over uh, 
the implant uh, platform. So the implant were placed slightly below the, uh, the bony crest and the bone crest is still there after 10 years of follow-up. So maybe the behavior also of the bone needs to be a better understanding. The biology not only of the soft tissue but also of the bone can change and thereafter can change the golden rules of the implant position when we maintain the regenerative potential on site, avoiding to open a big flap. Are guided surgery and prosthetic trustable in all the clinical scenario and for all the type of implant protocols? Uh, as I told you, we still need to consider guided surgery as a baby in terms of evidence-based implant approach. And therefore, the common sense and the experience of the operator uh, can still make the difference. However, what we do, we did at that time, in order to fill this gap in the literature, we conduct a randomized clinical trial comparing computer-guided versus free-end approach. And what we experienced, what we published as a take-home message was, first of all, that uh, we achieve a reasonable level of clinical accuracy. When we needed to validate a clinical protocol, we needed to consider more and more what we call clinical accuracy, because even the free-end approach can be featured with a certain amount of mistakes. Even when we plan a case and we deliver a case with a conventional free-end approach, we need to consider that uh, that implant treatment can be featured with some mistakes when we come up to what we plan and what we deliver in the patient mouth. In fact, the 3D deviation reported in the literature for the computer-guided approach didn't produce uh, in the patient that we investigate in this randomized clinical trial any clinically relevant drawback. We experience a high implant survival rate, 100% for the guided approach and 96% for the free-end approach. However, these two percentage of success were not statistically significant, so no difference between guided and free-end. But even before, uh, uh, all the cases were planned with the 3D implant planning software be before being allocated toward one group or another group. So the 3D planning can improve the performance of the guided or conventional free-end procedure. So we need to plan the case with the 3D implant planning approach, with the 3D more comprehensive implant approach. The immediate implant placement and loading in heel site and fresh extraction socket, so the most aggressive treatment in implant dentistry, were more predictable. We experienced an increased predictability for this type of treatment when we worked with a guided approach. And what is very nice, that at that time in one year manuscript, we experienced a better bone resorption pattern when the implant were positioned with the minimal invasive flapless or with the minimal mini flap, minimal invasive approach. And the, what at that time was only a more favorable trend in the five year results that we have recently gathered uh, uh, has become a better bone resorption pattern, statistically better bone resorption pattern. At the end, the last but not the least, for sure when we work with a 3D uh, planning and flapless approach, a minimal invasive approach, the patient can experience less pain and swelling. And this is so important in the uh, complete evaluation of the success of the implant case. Uh, However, as I told you before, the experience of the operator and the common sense of the operator 
it's still so important. So the plan is more important than the scan if we want to grab a quote for, from my dear friend Scott Gans. And that's why I don't use a fully guided approach for all the uh, implant protocols and for the all the clinical scenario. For example, wherever I need to keep the control on the final implant seating, I prefer a semi-guided pilot drilling approach. And this is in all the cases in which we are not confident that what we plan in the 3D implant planning software we can deliver in the patient mouth. So in this case we need to use the semi-guided approach in which the final drilling and the final uh, seating uh, is performed with a free-hand approach. However, this is a very interesting approach, and I really love it. And the results that we achieve so far is absolutely amazing. Let's come up to this uh, clinical case in which we have a failing uh, fixed dental prosthesis in the anterior zone, and the patient is expecting that our implant treatment can replace even better from the functional and aesthetic standpoint what a conventional fixed dental prosthesis did so far. And uh, uh, this is a, a new digital integrated workflow. It's a one uh, uh, way to perform a digital integrated workflow because you have seen that we are not working with an intraoral scanning, but we have taken a conventional impression uh, of the patient mouth and later on we can scan the model or we can scan the impression with a laboratory scanner with an extra oral optical uh, surface scanning uh, scanner and we can import this uh, surface scanning uh, file into the 3D implant planning software and uh, we can uh, merge with the, uh, an automatic workflow, we can really uh, overlap, overlay the DICON data of the patient with the surface scanning uh, data achieved from the optical scanning of the patient model. And uh, uh, you can see how uh, this type of new digital integrated workflow can uh, be can embrace all the need that the modern implant approach in the static nodes zone can needs to take into account because we can evaluate the patient's smile we can evaluate as the new tooth setup will challenge the smile of the patient so the tooth setup can accomplish the requirements of the smile line of the patient Moreover, we can visualize with the modern integrated digital workflow what I consider one of the most important parts when we come up to long-term success with the implant treatment is the soft tissue reconstruction. And particularly, I don't want to visualize the current soft tissue of the patient that has been completely destroyed by the, uh, by the, uh, the conventional fixed dental prosthesis. But what I want to visualize is the ideal soft tissue architecture that I want to deliver at the end of the treatment. Because this new uh, soft tissue driven approach can, can for sure implement the conventionally prosthetically driven approach. And at the end of the story, the implant positioning can be performed considering the bone data, the soft tissue architecture, the ideal running room or transmucosal uh, zone that we want around our restorative interface. And we can decide to place the ideal number of implant according to, not to our experience or our surgical and prosthetic skill, but according to the amount of surgical and restorative space that we have in each implant scenario, implant clinical scenario. The big advantage of working with the semi-guided approach that we can keep the final control 
on the final drilling of the recipient site and on the final positioning of the implant. And this is something absolutely amazing because at the beginning I didn't think that could be absolutely amazing because at the approach because I thought that we could miss the original planned implant positioning. But this is not the true because the two millimeter uh, semi-guided drilling it's enough particularly when we need to place narrow platform implant so when you place narrow platform implant for example 3.0 implant or 3.5 or 3.75 you just use one drill with a conventional free-end approach and uh, and uh, this is uh, amazing because it's uh, you can really maintain the original trajectory that uh, you plan into the software so for sure in case you uh, you need a larger number of drills after the semi-guided drilling protocol you can increase you can import into the surgical procedure more mistakes but in case you need to deliver a narrow platform implant the semi-guided approach really it's amazing according with your surgical skill and experience to keep the original trajectory and to get all the advantages of the guided approach maintaining at the same time the full prot the full control of the overall implant procedure so in this case for example it's a critical case is an anterior zone but but we were able to place in the proper position for adjacent implant. I'm not telling you that we guided you can place a four implant all the time to replace four incisor, but I'm telling you that the guided 3D planning will allow you to investigate if you have the minimum distance that will allow you to place the implant from the surgical and restorative standpoint in a predictable way. And that's why the implant were placed in true row, the two central incisors were placed in a front row, and the two uh, lateral incisors were placed uh, in a second row more lingually. That's why when we investigate the distance between the implant, we need to consider the bone and the implant site in a three-dimensional way. It's, it's, it's not correct that we analyze the distance between the implant and the adjacent teeth on a bidimensional perspective, typical of a periapical asses X-ray assessment. The bone is a three-dimensional structure, and they can be... Uh, it can survive or not survive according with the 3D distance between the implant and between the implant and the adjacent teeth. So in the restorative plan consisted in uh, delivering a four single metal free crown uh, cemented on the top of titanium abutment. Still today but particularly at that time, we had some limitation in terms of CAD CAM option on this super narrow 3.0 uh, platform. So we decided to deliver uh, three, uh, four titanium abutment and the, the grayness of the titanium abutment and the, the grayness of the Moreover, in order to recover space for the soft tissue all around the single crown, we decided to deliver single crown. We decided to deliver to a shorter less preparation of the titanium abutment. The final integration into the soft tissue it was pretty good and was maintained over time. And this is not because of my surgical or prosthetic skill, but because I planned the four, the four implants and I delivered with the semi-guided free-end approach the four implants, maintaining, considering and maintaining an amount 
of bone and soft tissue in between the implant that could guarantee that this structure could be vital over time. The integration when we deliver for single implant unit is absolutely amazing. The soft tissue are embracing the restorative contour properly modeled in order to increase how much as possible and enhance the maturation of the soft tissue over time. Even this case was investigated uh, is at the five years of follow-up is one of the oldest case that we conducted with the pristine version of the digital integrated workflow and as you can see at the five years of follow-up the buckle and the link plate all around the the four implant positioned is absolutely maintained without uh, uh, without any type of relevant bone resorption. And at the five years of follow-up, we took a lateral view uh, photography in order to demonstrate that even in this case, without any kind of soft tissue grafting, just maintaining the soft and bone tissue architecture, reducing the trauma, the surgical trauma during the implant positioning, we were able to maintain maintain the soft tissue architecture over time without implementing the amount of soft tissue. Uh, one of the most common questions when I lecture uh, worldwide, it's related to the use of guided surgery when the bone is missing. Uh, the management of the bone, it's very easy. When the bone is missing, we need to implement the bone. But this doesn't mean that we don't need to use the 3D implant planning software to plan an implant positioning staged after the guided bone regeneration or to plan a simultaneous implant positioning uh, uh, that can be deliver the same day of the guided bone regeneration procedure. In this case, for sure, again, I love the semi-guided approach because we can keep the control of the implant positioning, because we cannot expect that when we need to challenge a bone atrophy, we can keep the original trajectory that we plan uh, uh, in the 3D planning software. So when we need to deal with such a bone atrophy, like in this patient, in which we have two central and lower incisors that we need to replace, in which one central incisor has been lost during the trauma, and the other one, so we have a bone atrophy, and the other one with high tooth mobility needs to be extracted. You see the fenestration into the bone. So in this case, we we want to keep the final control on the final drilling because what we can plan in the software sometimes cannot be realized in the clinical reality, particularly when we work with a fully guided approach. When we work with a fully guided approach, we plan all the drilling step. With a semi-guided, we plan only the two millimeter twist drilling. In this case, uh, we use uh, a 1.5 millimeter semi-guided approach, and thereafter we use a two millimeter twist drill and finally, a 2.4, 2.8 step drill, but not for the entire length. And what we were able to deliver is a minimal invasive implant positioning in which we split a very tiny bony crest exactly in the middle. And we were able to position the implant without fracturing this fragile bone crest. So at the end of the treatment journey, for sure, instead of staging the implant positioning, we delivered the implant positioning the same day of the guided bone regeneration. And this is something that the patient can really appreciate because we can save one surgical time maintaining the same predictability. 
So why not, whenever we need to augment the bone, in any case, we plan the case since the beginning, included the ideal implant positioning and the implant drilling trajectory. We try to deliver the implant position during, during the same day of the guided bone regeneration. If this will not be predictable, we can step back and perform only the guided bone regeneration. But usually the semi-guided approach works very well with the guided bone regeneration procedure. This is the outcome validated after five months with the CBCT computer tomography that showed the tremendous uh, augmentation of the bone on the buccal side and uh, the final CBCT that will demonstrate how the bone is still there at the follow-up time point with two uh, um, uh, photography that demonstrate the final integration of the two metal-free uh, uh, implant supported single crown that uh, are matching the static, the function, and the biology of the two adjacent lateral incisors. After having a look at this movie uh, from the uh, beginning to the final delivery of the crown, let's point out the single uh, uh, steps of this uh, digital integrated workflow for this clinical case. So first of all, when we have multiple implants in the static zone, we need to try to import into the software all the information that we have uh, related to the variables that can affect your decision making and your clinical outcome. So in this case, for sure, we needed a 3D bone assessment. Uh, therefore, the combine uh, computer tomography, but uh, we also need uh, the uh, scanning of the model of the patient in order to import the soft tissue and in order to import also the ideal prosthetic contour uh, that we want to deliver on the top of these two implants. Maybe in, uh, in some restorative space that are super tight uh, to replace two central incisors, it can be an option also to place only one implant properly positioned underneath the one of the two dental units and can deliver the other one. But this is only in case in which we don't have enough space between the implant and the implant and the teeth to maintain a vital bone and soft tissue structure. Whenever it's possible, we try to use the 3D implant planning software to replace the implant with the, the, the tooth that are missing, the teeth that are missing, with a single implant. So we need the bone, we need the soft tissue, we need the prosthetic contour. For sure, as I told you, if the bone is missing, we are going to stage the function we are going to stage the loading, but at the same time, we try with a semi-guided approach to position the implant the day of the guided bone reconstruction. At the beginning of the uh, treatment journey, the bone crest, particularly on the left lateral incisor, was only two millimeter thick. This was the master class, the master cast of the patient with the two uh, dental unit walks up and with the walks up also of the soft tissue that we need to perform later on to achieve a soft tissue architecture that can embrace in a natural way the final restoration. So the different time point, the day of the surgery, we open a big flap because we need to perform a guided bone procedure. So we need to release all the muscular incision and we need to uncover the bone because we need to fix the bone issue. If the semi-guided approach will work properly, we can place the implant, otherwise we'll stage the implant at the end of the guided bone regeneration procedure, and particularly after that the bone completely recover from the guided bone regeneration. We never graft soft tissue and bone simultaneously, because I don't want any pressure onto the bone uh, while the bone is uh, regenerating. So I want to dedicate all my regenerative potential, all the regenerative potential of the patient to the bone regeneration. And after achieving the 
variable regeneration, we can implement the soft tissue. And this is what we did. The first scan is done, was done between five and six months of follow-up from the guided bone regeneration. And if the CBCT scan can demonstrate a good outcome of the bone regeneration procedure, we can plan and schedule the second stage surgery in which we are going to open a flap. We are going to carve the bone selectively in order to uncover the implant platform. And then we are going to graft soft tissue as we did onto the model to uh, create the proper soft tissue architecture. At this time point, we can load the implant uh, with the two provisional and suture all around. You can see the final outcome from the lateral perspective in order to demonstrate the excellent outcome of the bone and the soft tissue maturation. Don't forget that the soft tissue needs the bone and the no bone needs the soft tissue. So the soft tissue never stand alone. And that's why we plan, regardless the dimension of the implant site, we plan for sure guided bone regeneration first and soft tissue augmentation later on at the time of the delivery of the provisional. Uh, we are following up this, uh, this patient. Uh, we are still in follow-up. This is the three-year uh, follow-up time point and the related uh, um, combined CT that demonstrate that the, the outcome of the bone regeneration procedure and the outcome of the overall implant treatment with the final crown seated on the top of the two implant. Uh, so if you want to start to, to summarize a take-home message, guided surgery, is it reliable? Is it possible to plan an implant and deliver in the patient mouth, maintaining what we have planned? Absolutely, it's possible. I'm fully confident that I can tell you that today with the modern digital integrated workflow, it's absolutely reliable, the guided implant positioning. Is it reliable to fabricate in advance a temporary restoration? Yes, it is. It's absolutely trustable and reliable, fabricate in advance with a CAD CAM process, an interim restoration that can be de delivered the day of the surgery, shortening the overall treatment time and making the immediate function more predictable than with the conventional free end approach. However, our ends are featured with a certain amount of mistakes. So it's very funny that we look for the accuracy of the digital workflow, but nobody asked to ourselves uh, which is the accuracy of our hands, which is it the mean mistakes for what we think being good and what we really deliver in the patient mouth. There are a few manuscripts, particularly two manuscripts that investigated the uh, the accuracy of the conventional free end approach comparing with the accuracy of the dynamic, gavi, uh, dynamic guided surgery of navigation. And you see that, uh, you have seen that the lack of accuracy is absolutely comparable, the lack of accuracy of our free end compared with the well conducted guided surgery procedure. So why we should expect 100% of accuracy from guided surgery when, when the current gold standard, our hands, it's not perfectly accurate at all. Maybe just because we are investing in the technology and we are expecting in the technology something more than what we expect for our hands. But do not forget that the difference digital doesn't mean shortcut. Digital means that we have to continue to keep our brain on and keep the control of the digital process because otherwise we can go through mistakes. And which are the major source of mistakes? First of all, we don't want to use any more 
hybrid or a, a digital process in which we go back and forth from the digital reality to the uh, to the clinical reality and back to the digital if we want to increase the accuracy the overall accuracy and reliability of the guided surgery and guided prosthetics we need to stay in digital we need to create what we call a virtual dental patient and the virtual dental patient it's absolutely a fine and effective uh, um, when we come up to single and partial tooth. For the full dentulous case, we still need to wait, but uh, it's amazing the continuous improvement and evolution of the digital process all over the world. So if we want to summarize, uh, whenever is possible, I love to keep the teeth in the patient mouth also when I need to treat a terminal dentition patient because the tooth supported template are more accurate than mucosa supported template and for sure I don't want to do any more guided surgery with the bone supported template because this means that I need to elevate a large flap and I don't want that the guided surgery uh, means minimal invasiveness, uh, surgical and prosthetic invasiveness. So whenever it's possible, I need the stiff support. That's why I love to keep strategic teeth and to support my template and increase the overall accuracy. The fully digital uh, workflow may be more accurate, but uh, as I told you, we need uh, to stay in digital. We need to create a virtual uh, a dental patient that will be transformed in a real patient the day of the surgery. Let me conclude my uh, um, lecture today with the, the latest uh, fascinating concept because uh, we are talking more and more about soft tissue driven implant treatment and uh, one of the major drawback uh, and limitation of the pristine 3D software was uh, uh, related to the lacking in terms of soft tissue pre-visualization. The soft tissue are so important because in this nice interface, in this the restorative contour, the soft tissue and the bone, the restorative contour, the soft tissue and the bone tissue and the implant platform, we have the key to succeed over time. That's why with the new digital workflow, purely digital workflow, with the use of intraoral scanning devices, we can import into the software mouth so we can import the anatomy of the mouth so we can import the anatomy of the remaining dentition but most of all the anatomy of the soft tissue and we can work out the soft tissue issue before placing the implant so just I want to give you an example a simple case a central incisor we have plenty of bone but for this case the bone is not the issue the patient unfortunately experienced a root uh, an internal root resorption due to a, an appropriate internal bleaching procedure. And we were obliged to replace uh, this central incisor. Is it trustable to uh, use guided surgery in this critical scenario in which the bone is not an issue? The issue is uh, the soft tissue that is very thin. The issue is uh, the adjacent uh, periodontal attachment that is very fragile. That's why uh, I don't go for guided immediate implant positioning whenever is possible. I go for the proper decision making. I love to personalize the decision making. In this case, I want to stage the implant positioning after having improved the bone issue, having fixed the bone issue. That's why we perform a bog augmentation the day of the um, uh, tooth extraction in order to uh, balance the buccal level of the bone with the lingual level of the bone. And thereafter, uh, uh, in the same surgical procedure, we augment the soft tissue in order to have the day of the implant positioning 
much more soft tissue to manipulate and to create a nice soft tissue architecture. So just to uh, remember you, uh, the, the current gold standard, we take an impression, we pour a masterclass in the proper way, and then we carve the stone, we carve the plaster, and we wax up the tooth. This is what we have to do the day of the surgery. Unfortunately, when we work onto the stone, we don't know how much we can carve the stone because we don't know how much we can carve the soft tissue. We don't know the uh, interrelationship between the bone and the soft tissue. That's why I was so wondered when I start to reconfigure the soft tissue into the software before taking any decision regarding the implant positioning. So, in an easy way, uh, we can customize the implant positioning according with the ideal gingival parabola that we want to deliver. So planning in a 3D software doesn't mean only uh, fabricate a nice to shape. This is maybe uh, the, the most stupid part of the entire workflow, because with the virtual tooth library, we can easily find out the ideal tooth shape that uh, will fit the restorative requirement of this uh, recipient site. What is amazing that I can jump back and forth from the surgical software to the restorative software. Now the implant is not yet there, but you can see the implant analog into the software because after planning the software in the surgical, after planning the implant in the surgical software, now we transfer the implant positioning into the restorative software and we can fabricate the ideal interim restoration that will match the implant platform or that will match the, the abutment that we have chosen for this implant case. Finally, we can deliver a nice tooth shape and contour and we can address the occlusal contact in order to deliver a tooth, an infra-occlusion, in order to avoid any kind of contact in the occlusion and during the eccentric movement of the mandible. Because the modern restorative software are able to, are featured with a very nice virtual articulator that works very well when we come up to single and partial tooth. So now you can see the difference between a conventional prosthetically driven concept and the modern prosthetically driven concept in which with the tooth shape we go beyond the soft tissue surface to match the shoulder of the abutment. And we can still make some fine tuning of the implant positioning, correcting the implant angulation, the implant depth, according with the nice prosthetic emergence that we want to deliver in this patient. At this time point, after this uh, uh, final tuning between the restorative doctor and the oral surgeon, we can deliver the perfect implant case, in which we don't only deliver the guided implant positioning, but we deliver also a prefabricated uh, single crown that is exactly the link between the surgical planning and the prosthetic planning. This uh, temp shell option is absolutely amazing and is the uh, practical and pragmatic link for what we plan and what we have to deliver. So the same tooth shape that we use for planning can be transformed in a clique in a tooth shape that can be fabricated short side. And this tooth shape can guide the incision in order to being as minimal invasive as possible. Because even if we have implemented bone and the soft tissue, the situation and the clinical scenario is still critical. We don't want to jeopardize the periodontal attachment of the adjacent teeth that will guarantee the soft tissue maturation and the papilla maintenance and the overgrow over time. So even this case was treated with a guided approach and what we delivered the day of the surgery is a 3.75 narrow platform parallel implant 
super long, 50 millimeter long, that was able to engage uh, the regenerative bond, but also the native bond, in order to ensure and guarantee the proper primary stability. Not only we were able to deliver a prefabricated standard zirconia abutment that we are using as a temporary abutment, because we strongly believe that the low plaque accumulation uh, capacity and property of the zirconia surface can contribute in the critical time point of the implant positioning when we place time point of the implant positioning when we place uh, can contribute to the maturation of the soft tissue. The last but not the least, can you see how the temp shell perfectly fit the abutment shoulder? And this is something absolutely amazing because uh, we were able to shorten the overall delivery of the of the, the temporary crown and this is one of the most important of the treatment we can focus more and more on the guided surgery on the surgical aspect in case we need we can graft connected tissue because we are confident that we can shorten it we can shorten the overall treatment time speeding up the delivery of the, of the uh, provisional crown thanks to this uh, guided prosthetic approach. So if we look at the different uh, uh, time points, we stage the implant positioning because we want to implement the bonus of tissue first, then we work, we uh, position the implant with the super minimal invasive approach and we use a 3.75 noble parallel implant because we strongly trust that in the anterior zone we want less tight gap the delivery of the of the uh, particularly when the alignment of the adjacent teeth uh, make critical the decision making about the implant positioning. So we want a thickening of this papilla, we want a thickening of the bony peak adjacent to the implant. And the, what we experience is a tremendous speed up of the soft tissue healing. In this case, we didn't graft any connective tissue. So new fascinating concept because we have a prosthetic scaffold that is composed by two parts, an aesthetic and functional part that is above the soft tissue and the biologic part that is below the soft tissue. The two parts work together to guide the soft and the bone tissue healing in order to make more predictable the success over time. This was the final restoration that we deliver five months after the implant positioning. So what uh, uh, 20 years ago at the beginning of my career as implantology did in one year because I spent lots of time uh, manipulating the soft tissue, compensate the continuing mistakes in the implant positioning, in the prosthetic delivery, we were able to deliver in less than five months with a pure digital approach composed by guided implant position and guided prosthetics. And if you look at the periapical assessment, new fascinating concept, because I never placed the implant exactly in the middle of the recipient site. I always place and personalize the implant position in order to drive the biology toward the weak part of the recipient site. And that's why I love to talk not only about a guided implant positioning and guided prosthetics, but also guided bone healing and guided soft tissue healing. Fortunately, time is over. Let me welcome you to Rome to attend one of my digital intensive course in which I will drive you through the fascinating world of a digital implant dentistry, in which you'll be able to use the software, plan the case, a real clinical case, plan your real clinical case, and you'll be able to attend the surgical theater looking at live surgical and prosthetic procedure in order to increase your digital knowledge and get all the benefit of treating your 
single, partial, and full edentulous patient with the most advanced digital technology. I really welcome you in Rome. Thank you.